David R. here. Today I'm going to talk to you about this book, The Testosterone Hypothesis, How Hormones Regulate the Life Cycles of Civilization by Roy Barsilai. This is a unique book. It's one I think every man should read. Maybe a woman too, if you're interested in that. But I think it's more oriented towards men. From the author's website, TestosteroneCivilization.com, he says, Sex, life, death. What is it that drives us towards sex, fuels life, and makes death inevitable? As it turns out, it's the same thing. Testosterone. Not only does testosterone fuel the passion for reproduction and play a critical role in the length of our lives, it is an integral component to the mechanism of human civilization, its triumphs and tragedies. In order to understand the forces that drive the life cycles of human cultures and that form the engine of history, the testosterone hypothesis goes to the fundamental building blocks of human neuroscience. Our hormones are the impetus for our history. That right there gives you a really good summary as to what this book is about. But I'm going to go a little further and talk about some of the things in the book. This way to give you an idea of what to expect if you decide to read it. What is testosterone? According to a Harvard Medical School article, testosterone, what it does and doesn't do, Testosterone is a major sex hormone in males and plays a number of important roles, such as the development of penis and testes, the deepening of the voice during puberty, the appearance of facial hair and pubic hair at puberty. Later in life, it may play a role in balding. Muscle size and strength, bone growth and strength, sex drive, libido, sperm production. And symptoms of low testosterone are basically the opposite of those that I mentioned, like uh, you'll have low libido, brutal bones, loss of body hair, reduced sperm count, etc. Testosterone and the mind. In this section, the author goes over serotonin, dopamine, cortisol, oxytocin, testosterone, and estrogen. The first one is serotonin. This is a neural transmitter associated with mood and feelings of well-being and happiness. When serotonin is low, a person will suffer from depression and will be more prone to passivity and fear. The weakened psychological vitality of entire populations is due to low serotonin. Yeah, you can see that in the world today. You know, look around you know, whatever country you live in, there's a lot of depression going on. It means the serotonin is low. And people who have low serotonin are more susceptible to group think, to herd mentality and manipulation by controlling forces. Government takes advantage of this, this group think. People are more inclined to socialism. And if you think about it, though, this group think herd mentality issue, it's more feminine, not masculine. Men are less prone to group think. But when men are feminized, well, they start acting like women. And there you go. Low serotonin makes a person passive, not aggressive, and see where we are. Dopamine. Dopamine is a hormone that functions as a neurotransmitter involved with the brain's reward and pleasure centers. Higher dopamine means innovation and prosperity. Lower dopamine means procrastination, unwilling to take risks, addictions to stimulants. You see that all the time. Poor memory. If I consume too many sugary products, I, I have memory issues. But then once I cut back, I get rid of the sugar for a while, my memory is much better, you see. And this means it's lowering my dopamine. And so weight gain is another one, lack of motivation and procrastination. You see, the dopamine needs to be high. And I, I think of somebody like Steve Jobs. He probably had higher dopamine because he's very innovative. 
cortisol is a stress hormone that works with the brain to control fear, mood, and motivation. It is responsible for the fight or flight response when the brain perceives danger. Yeah, when it's too high, then you have a lot of fearful people and testosterone goes down. I see this a lot. Cortisol is high because of stress, poor eating habits, not sleeping properly, living in a feminized culture. That would do it too, where the rules keep changing all the time. Oxytocin, this one is associated with love. It's the love hormone or the cuddle drug, usually associated with women after sex. They want to cuddle. Uh, five is testosterone, as I mentioned earlier. And testosterone is the civilization builder. Then we have estrogen, which is the female sex hormone, primarily at least. But men can produce estrogen as well. And when men have too much estrogen, they become infertile. They have erectile dysfunction. They feel exhausted all the time. You know, their mind isn't right. <laughs> kind of makes you wonder what goes on inside a woman's mind. But uh, that's how it is when men have too much estrogen. Again, I list these hormones because the author refers to them throughout the book, and they're important to learn. Testosterone and society. Okay, this is basically the heart of the book. He says the societal hormonal cycles move from peak testosterone levels, like in the era of Moses, to low testosterone societies, where we are now, essentially. He traces social mood throughout history. Social mood is high, that means testosterone is high. Social mood is low, testosterone is low. And he theorizes that there are peaks and valleys in testosterone levels. For instance, here's a valley, the Dark Ages and the Black Plague. This brought a collapse in social mood. Social mood was low, therefore testosterone was low. Then the Enlightenment comes along and testosterone goes up. Social mood goes up. In the 7th and 8th centuries, testosterone was high. And fertility was high. Social mood was high. You see how that works? And he says this is the age of reason and the birth of capitalism. Capitalism is associated with high testosterone. In the 20th century, the uh, author equates Nazi Germany with low testosterone. He says a combination of high stress in the mammalian brain inducing cortisol and oxytocin will produce a fascist, militaristic human culture that venerates violence and conquest and subjugation of other societies in order to eliminate perceived threats. There was a rise in testosterone between 1942 and 1957. And during the 50s, fertility rates rose. And there was a return to traditional family values. A great economic boom. Yeah, a good economy is associated with higher testosterone. So where are we now? So as it stands, we are an aging population with declining fertility rates. Now, I don't necessarily associate all of that with aging. There's younger people don't have that many kids, if they have any at all. I don't have any children. But... Um, you see, I don't consider that entirely an aging situation. He says, we also suffer from diseases associated with aging, mental stress, and brain degeneration. I guess like Alzheimer's and things. Other signs of degeneration include the collapse of the family, high divorce rates, and the rise of single-parent households. Yeah, if you want to destroy society, you attack the family. You get rid of the family. You have children raised by a single parent, a woman primarily. And that child grows up to be a criminal, usually. Not in all cases, but usually the child grows up to be a criminal. He has 
no healthy male figure in his life. If it's a girl, she's probably going to have a child at an early age and she's going to have daddy issues. It's going to be a mess. If that's what you want to do to destroy society. And another thing is you insert feminism into that mix. The author doesn't talk about that so much, but I do. Entertainment, you know, you have rap, hip hop. They celebrate gangster themes. And rap disparages the rule of law and promotes violence against women. But I would like to add that drag queen story time is another example of degeneration. And then you have uh, women dancing in front of children like a stripper, you know, with a big pole there. Uh, I used to go to strip clubs, and that was the only place I ever saw the pole dance. And you never saw any children there, but I, I'm assuming by the way things are today, maybe they allow children in the strip clubs. I mean, if you look at this right here, you know, I mean, I don't know what this is, but I don't like it. And it's an example of a degenerate society. Another thing is the viewing public immerses itself in reality TV shows. I mean, those are the worst. No healthy individual should even watch that. Colleges are anti-reason, anti-logic. Because logic and reason are usually associated with the masculine. You get rid of them if you want to harm a society, right? The death of the male figure is the death kneel of a society. Get rid of the masculine and you've destroyed your society. And that's what we see now. Everything is feminized. You know, there are no male spaces. Very few, if any. You know, women are everywhere. They want to control what men talk about, what men see, how men think. So, in conclusion, this is a unique book worth reading. I added a lot of things um, that weren't exactly in the book, but I think it still works with the spirit of, of what he uh, teaches. Well, anyway, that's all I got. Talk to you later. Bye.